All right, Thanks. ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> welcome to Daily Power Parsha. Today is Wednesday, June 8th, 2022. And we are gathered here to study the daily reading of the Torah portion. So, you know, we have uh, uh, usually on Wednesdays this time of year with JLI, we don't meet on Thursdays. So we're going to seek to cover both the fourth reading and the fifth reading. So today and tomorrow's reading. So that Friday, we'll only be left with two readings, the sixth and the seventh. Hope that made sense. All right, let's jump in. Um, I have the readings up on my side. I will uh, pop it up on the screen as well. Let's do it. Torah reading for Nasso. As always, that is in the diaspora because in Israel, they're already next week. They're way ahead of their time. It's uh, Baalotcha. By the way, that reminds me of the story of, of Israel being ahead of its time. So they were, um, the story goes that they were digging in Italy and they found, um, I don't know, what did they find? They found um, in Italy, they were digging and they found uh, some sort of wiring, copper wires or something, lines. And they said, oh, this seems to indicate that Back in the day, they had some sort of technology that we didn't realize they had. I'm butchering the joke, but whatever. And then they digged in Greece and they found something else. And they said, oh, this is a historical artifact of what technology they had. And then they dug in Israel. They found nothing. So the Israelis said, aha, this proves that a thousand years ago, we had Wi-Fi. All right. Um, let's, yep, that was the joke. I didn't say it was good. I just said that was that. So Israel is always ahead of its time. And one week ahead in the Torah portions, at least for right now. But this week, for us, it is Nusso, reading number five. Now, we let me just give you a quick recap how we got here. Hey, Olya, welcome. So in the first three readings or so, you read extensively about the census or the multiple censuses that were taken for the Jewish people. Um, the entire nation was counted men of military age at least, the Levites were counted twice from 30 days up and from 30 years old to 50 years old. And we ran all the numbers. We talked about the roles of everyone, where they encamped. We had a lot of conversations about that. And now, and now we have a new conversation. Numbers chapter seven, verse number one. And it was on that day. Sorry, and it was on the day that Moses finished erecting the Mishkan, which, by the way, was Rosh Chodesh Nisan, one year after the Exodus. The Exodus took place on the 15th day of Nisan, 2448. One year later, minus 15 days, on Rosh Chodesh Nisan 1, 2449, that is when this is happening. It was on the day that Moses finished erecting the Mishkan. He anointed it sanctified it and all its vessels and the altar and all its vessels, whoops, and he anointed them and sanctified them. Basically, everything was built, everything was put together, everything was anointed with the oil, was sanctified, etc. Let's continue. And on that day, Rosh Chodesh Nisan, the first day of Nisan, 2449 from creation, the chieftains of Israel the heads of their father's houses presented their offerings. Let me explain what's going on here. 12 tribes, 12, 12 chieftains, one per tribe. Every day for the first 12 days of the month of Nisan, from the day the Mishkan was finally open for business. That was day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, day eight, day nine, day 10, day, 10, day, day 11, day 12. Every day, a different tribe brought an offering, or more specifically, the head of the tribe brought an offering on behalf of the tribe. So the chieftains of Israel, the heads of their father's houses, presented their offerings. They were the leaders of the tribes. They were the ones who were present during the counting. The Torah is telling us which heads of the tribes were these. These were the ones that helped the census that helped take the count of each tribe along with Moses and Aaron who were to count the Jewish people. 
And they brought their offering before the Lord. What did they bring? As a donation, six covered wagons, 12 oxen. Okay, so six wagons and 12 oxen. That means two oxen per wagon. You with me on this? You have a, a covered wagon. I'm picturing, I don't know, like uh, American, um, <laughs> you know, explorers go west in those uh, little covered wagons. I'm sure it was different. But six covered wagons, 12 oxen, two per wagon, a wagon for each two chieftains. In other words, two tribes, true tribal leaders pitched in for one wagon and an ox for each one. There were 12 oxen, one for each tribe or one for each tribal leader. They presented them in front of the Mishkan. That was their gift, their collective gift. I told you that each tribe brought a different offering on each of the first 12 days of the month of Nisan from the day that the Mishkan was inaugurated. That is true. The Torah here is describing the donation of the Nisim, of the leaders, Nisim are the leaders, the name of the leaders, the, the leaders of the tribes on the day of the Mishkan's opening, six wagons, 12 oxen. All right. By the way, there's a, there's a very profound lesson that I'm going to share about this a little bit later. Let's continue. God tells Moses what to do with this gift. The Lord spoke to Moses. Imagine Moses being like, what do I do with wagons and oxen? What do I do? So God tells Moses the following. Take it from them. Accept the gift. And let them be used. In other words, let the wagons and the oxen be used in the service of the tent of meeting. You shall give them the wagons and the oxen to the Levites in accordance with each man's work. In other words, we just read over the first few days of this week that it was the job of the Levites to dismantle, transport, and reassemble the Mishkan. You know what would make the transportation part even easier? Imagine you're schlepping a Mishkan, schlepping a portable sanctuary throughout the desert in the hot sun. You know what would make it really easy? Wagons pulled by oxen. There you go. Um, there's a company in New York called, what is it called? Mazel Tov Movers? I think it's called Mazel Tov Movers. Anyway, this would be, um, yeah, Mishkan Oxen and Wagon LLC. Uh, they transported the Mishkan. So these were given to the Levites. So Moses, that's what God tells Moses. So Moses, verse 6, Moses took the wagons and the cattle, the oxen, and gave them to the Levites. There were three Levite families. What do they each get? Here we go. He breaks it down. Torah gives, it, gives us the, the details. He gave two wagons and four oxen to the sons of Gershon, according to their work. Just so you know, Gershon, they transported the curtains and the tapestries of the Mishkan, the coverings and the curtains and the, um, the screens, right? All the fabric was uh, carried by Gershon or not even carried. Turns out they used two wagons and four oxen to transport all that stuff. Let's continue. And he gave four wagons and eight oxen to the sons of Merari, according to their work under the direction of Itamar, the son of Aaron, the priest. What did Merari do? Why did they need four wagons? And, that's a lot of wagons and oxen. If you recall, they were the ones that transported the actual hardware of the Mishkan, i.e. the frame, the beams, the sockets, the pillars, the rods, the heavy stuff, heavy wood and silver and gold. That's what they carried. So it was helpful to have four wagons and eight oxen to do that. By the way, two wagons and four oxen to Gershon, four wagons and eight oxen to Merari. How many wagons does that leave? Two plus four is six. How many wagons were left? Zilch. How many oxen were left? Nada. Nothing was left. But there's one more family, Kahat. So the Torah says, but to the sons of Kahat, he did not give. They didn't get any wagons or any oxen. Why? For incumbent upon them was the work involving the holy objects, which they were to carry on their shoulders. They had to physically transport their items on their shoulders. What was their job? Their job was to carry and to transport the vessels of the Mishkan the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Menorah, the, the, the two, the, the two Mizbeachs, the two um, altars, the showbread table. 
they were to carry the actual holy objects of the Mishkan on their shoulders. If you recall, when we studied the book of Exodus and describing these vessels, they all had poles. Remember the Torah says, insert poles into them? Why poles? To carry it on their shoulders. So even though they got a donation of, of wagons, not for you guys, sorry, you guys are manual labor. You guys are manually lifting these items through the wilderness. You don't get the, uh, the wagons and the oxen. Who got it? Gershon, the family that was carrying the curtains, and Merari, the ones who were carrying the actual beams and sockets. They got the wagons. They got not. They they had the opportunity to not schlep all you know on their shoulders the whole way. But Kahat, they had to. By the way, a quick lesson in life: some things you can delegate, some things you got to do yourself. As to what is what, that takes a wise person to figure out. No, I don't mean that you should do everything yourself because there's value in your signature on it. That seems like a little bit overkill, right? We don't we don't want to start. Um, um, uh, doing everything ourselves to the point that we're not able to be useful. But I will tell you, along these lines, I'm just thinking about this right now. You know, the Rebbe stood every Sunday in the Latin later years and gave out dollars and, uh, and blessings. The Rebbe, met, the Rebbe opened every letter himself. One time, one of the secretaries presented the Rebbe with a gift that was a letter opener. Remember those letter openers back in the day when people used to get real mail? <laughs> letter openers, email, boom. Um, but letter openers. And the Rebbe said, no, thank you. Why? The Rebbe got more mail than the president of the United States. Just so you, I don't know who's sending mail to the president, but apparently it's, it's, a, lot, it's, a, it's a way of measuring a lot of volume of mail. The Rebbe did not use a, a letter opener. Why? He said, because the woman who writes the letter about a pressing matter and her tears, right? Her tears, she's, she, she's crying. And she, her tears are mixed in to, the, um, to seal the envelope. You can't, you can't feel that. You can't sense that with a letter opener. That's what he said. That's what he said. You can't, you can't connect with that with a letter opener. So the Rebbe didn't delegate a lot of things. The Rebbe himself handed out honey cake before the high holidays, handed out matzah before Passover, gave out dollars and blessings. The Rebbe, of course, who else are you going to get a blessing from? But my point is that certain, the things that are really important, you don't delegate. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to rank the Mishkan, but the vessels of the Mishkan, the Ark, don't delegate that to an ox and a, and a wagon. The menorah, no ox and wagon. The showbread table, no, no ox and wagon. The curtains, the tapestries, the screens, the beams, that you can put. It takes a wise person to know what to delegate and what to do with one's direct effort. All right, or one di one, one's direct um, energy. Let's continue. Um. Okay, so that, that was a collective gift, just to be very clear here. That was a collective gift that the heads of the tribes gave. Um, six wagons, 12 oxen. All right, let's continue. The chieftains, verse 10, the chieftains brought offerings for the dedication of the altar on the day it was anointed. Again, Rosh Chodesh Nisan 2449. They brought offerings for the altar. The chieftains presented their offerings in front of the altar. The Lord said to Moses, one chieftain each day, one chieftain each day shall present his offering for the dedication of the altar. Don't bring it all on day one. Imagine 12 tribal leaders all bringing their offering. That's going to be like, stretch it out, right? Who wants one day of Hanukkah gifts? Give me eight days of gifts, right? Spread out the love. Spread out the love, baby, right? Spread it out. 12 days, 12 tribes, 12 chieftains. Great. One chieftain each day. One chieftain each day shall present his offering for the dedication of the altar. So what were these offerings? We read about their collective gift. What, were, what was the offering that they brought to inaugurate the altar? So here we go. The one who brought his offering on the first day, that would have been Rosh Chodesh Nisan was Nachshon, the son of Aminadab of the tribe of Judah. Judah goes first. 
Judah was like the royal tribe even then. Nachshon, as I've mentioned before, was the one who, at the time of the splitting of the sea, he was the one when God said, keep on moving, he walked into the water. The water rose, or he walked deeper and deeper into the water till it got to his nose, and that's when the sea split. Nachshon is the guy who took the plunge. He's the guy who walks in head first. All right, let's continue. What did he bring? And his offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels, one silver sprinkling basin weighing 70 shekels according to the holy shekel. Both the bowl and the basin were filled with fine flour mixed with olive oil for a meal offering. Kind of cool, right? They brought uh, essentially a meal offering, flour and water. Sorry, that's matzah. Flour and oil. Okay, that was their meal offering. But they brought so it was the vegetarian option. It was the, yeah. Well, you'll see soon. They mixed. They got the meat in there in a second. Ah, um, okay. But the cool thing is they brought it in silver bowls. I mean, you could just bring it in anything, but they donated the bowls as well. That's kind of cool. A, a real. I mean, this is solid silver, silver bowl and a silver sprinkling basin filled with this the flour offering. Let's continue. They also brought one spoon weighing ten shekels of gold, a golden spoon, filled with incense. They don't just bring incense in a golden spoon that you can keep. What, and now we get to the, to the I was going to say meat and potatoes, but all puns intended all the time forever. One young bull, one ram, and one lamb in its first year for a burnt offering. So for a burnt offering, an ola were three animals, a bull, a ram, and a lamb. Then one young he goat for a sin offering. So there was a burnt offering and a sin offering, and now a peace offering. And for the peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs in the first year. That's a lot of animals. It's a lot of livestock. That's why they didn't do this times 12 and each day it'll be like, hold on. There's way, way too many animals here. Divvy this up, you know, spread this out over the days. This was the offering of Nachshon, the son of Amin Adab. He brought that offering on the first day. The Mishkan was open for business to inaugurate the altar. He brought these as offerings. He brought a meal offering in silver bowls. He brought incense. So the meal offering is brought on the altar. The incense is burnt on the altar. And of course, the burnt offering, sin offering, and peace offerings were also brought on the altar. Just as a reminder, that what's the difference between a burnt offering, a sin offering, and a peace offering? They had different roles. A burnt offering is straight up a donation to God. Somebody wants to give a gift to God, the whole thing is burnt on the altar. No one eats from it. It's a gift completely consumed by the altar for God. Sin offering is, as the name uh, indicates, for indiscretion. Not intentional sin, but inadvertent sin, which everyone is guilty of because shigia is me oven. We, who knows the, uh, the mistakes that we make? We all make mistakes, even when we have best of intentions. And a peace offering was something, an animal that was eaten uh, it was brought as an offering. Some went on the altar. Some was eaten by the Kohen and some by the person who brought it. Peace meaning everyone enjoyed from it. So it brought, I'm not going to say everyone had a piece of it. It's a different piece, right? But everyone had a, had a place uh, or, 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 or had some of it. And thus it brought peace to all three parties involved. All right, that was all day one. On the second day, I mean, we could sing a song on the second day of Nisan, Nisan, no ben su ar. No, I didn't say that. The second day, it was Nathaniel, Nathaniel, the son of Tsuar, the chieftain of Issachar, brought his offering. And by the way, spoiler alert, just so you know, they all brought the exact same thing. But the Torah mentions it every single time. All 12, all 12 days. And you'll see. I, buckle up. It's about to happen. He brought, Nathanael, he brought his offering of, you guessed it, one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels, one silver sprinkling basin weighing 70 shekels. It was in season and anthropology. According to the holy shekel, both filled with fine flour mixed with olive oil for meal offering. I was kidding. For anybody wondering if that was serious, no. Um, but they brought the identical items. One spoon weighing 10 shekels of gold filled with incense and one young bull, one ram and one lamb in its first year for a burnt offering, one young he goat for a sin offering and for the peace offering, you guessed it, two oxen, 
five rams, five he goats, five lambs in the first year. This was the offering of Nathanael, the son of Tzuar. On the third day, the chieftain was of the sons of Zebulun, Zebulun, and it was Eliab, the son of Helon. His offering was identical. One silver bowl weighing 100, 130 shekel, one silver sprinkling basin weighing 70 shekels, according to the holy shekel, both filled with fine flour mixed with olive oil for a meal offering. One spoon weighing 10 shekels of gold filled with incense. One young bull, one ram, one lamb in its first year for a burnt offering. One young he goat for a sin offering. And for the peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs in the first year. This was the offering of Eliab, the son of Halon. On the fourth day, the chieftain was of the sons of Reuben, Elitzur, the son of Shedeor. By the way, I'll talk about the order of the tribes in a little bit. Remind me, if I don't, if I don't get back to it, I'm going to mention Reuben was the firstborn, and yet he went fourth. We'll talk about that. Okay, we'll talk about that. So fourth day was um, from Reuben, Elitzur, the son of Shedeor. His offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels, one silver sprinkling basin weighing 70 shekels, according to the holy shekel, both full of fine flour mixed with olive oil for a meal offering, one spoon weighing 10 shekels of gold filled with incense, one young bull, one ram and one lamb in its first year for a burnt offering, one young he goat for sin offering and for the peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs in their first year. This was the offering of Elitzur, the son of Shedeor. You guys ready for more? It's going to sound the same. On the fifth day, the chieftain was of the sons of Simeon, Shimon, the second son of Jacob. Shalumiel, the son of Tsuri Shaddai. His offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels, one silver sprinkling basin weighing 70 shekels, according to the Holy Shekel, both filled with fine flour mixed with olive oil for a meal offering. One spoon weighing 10 shekels of gold filled with incense. One young bull, one ram and one lamb in its first year for a burnt offering. One young he goat for a sin offering and for the peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs in the first year. And this was the offering of Shalumiel, the son of Tsuri Shaddai. That takes us to the end of the reading. I have a question that you also may have. What are we doing? What? Why not just say, first day, um, Nachshon? The son of Aminadav, he brought his offering. This is what he did. Ditto, 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 ditto. Just let's wrap this thing up. Just say like, and so, and thus did all the tribes for the first 12 days. I could come up with a sense or two to knock this, uh, this, this dialogue out. Now, especially if you consider that the Torah is so precise with, with language. If you study the Talmud, you realize that you learn laws from like an extra word, sometimes even an extra letter because of the precision of Torah. And yet here it seems that the Torah is wasting dozens of verses to essentially repeat the same thing 12 times. It makes no sense. Anybody want to offer uh, a solution to this question? Every tribe has equal value. Good. Every tribe well, equal and value. I think it was, names are important. So I think it had importance to know the names of the members of each of the tribes who indeed brought the gifts. Good. Okay, good. Good. So I'll share with you the Rebbe's insight, which is similar. The Rebbe says, I would say it's similar, but it also like it's also one other idea. Not only is each individual worthy of being mentioned, and not only are they all equal. But each one, even though they brought the same, the identical items, each one did it with their own flavor. Each one did it with their own energy. And therefore, the Torah repeats it 12 times to tell us that although on the surface, it looks like they did the exact same thing, it wasn't the same experience. Each day, that person on behalf of their tribe had a different experience because people are different. And this is a lesson, for example, for prayer. We're all reading the same words from the Siddur. But you look in a synagogue and that person and that person, you and I, we're not having the same experience. We might be saying the same words. We might be looking at the same ideas, but because we're individuals and we come with our own, I don't know, stories. So every experience is unique. In essence, really, 
by expending dozens and probably five verses for each tribe or so times 11, 55, by like 50 plus verses, by expending all those verses on this seemingly repetition, the Torah is actually pointing out or telling us the opposite. It's not a repetition. It's not a repetition. If it was just a repetition, we don't have to say it. It's not a repetition. Why? Because each experience was unique. And it reminds us that we can do the same mitzvah as the other person. We could say the same prayers, study the same Torah, but we are to have a, a unique individual experience. God wants us to bring our personality into the, into the mix. So we shouldn't feel like, ah, what, is it? what does it matter? What does it matter? One of my favorite stories, speaking of the Rebbe and letters, I, I'm sure I've told this story before many times. I love this story. It was right before my bar mitzvah. And one of my teachers in Pittsburgh shared the following story that happened to him when he was turning bar mitzvah story in a story. Okay. He said that he had, and, and I did the same thing back in the day, you would send um, an invitation for your bar mitzvah or wedding or whatever to 770 to the Rebbe's office. And you would get back a letter of blessing on the occasion of whatever life cycle event it was, whether it's the occasion of a birth of a child or a bris or an upshernish or a bat mitzvah, bar mitzvah, wedding. So my teacher, Rabbi Rosenblum, he tells me that he was turning bar mitzvah. He sent in the invitation. His parents sent in the invitation. He got back a letter from the rabbi. And he was so excited. He got a, a real letter signed by the rabbi. He was like over the moon, just like, at, like cloud nine. Until one of his friends told him, Everyone gets the same letter. Literally, it's a four, it's the same letter. The secretary has just changed the date, the name, and there's a there's a signature. The Rebbe signs it. Yes, that's it's authentic, but it's the same letter. He felt kind of bummed, like, well, maybe it's not that personal. I mean, it's signed, but like it wasn't like crafted. Anyway, a little while later, he goes by the Rebbe, still before his bar mitzvah. It was like um before there was like a few times a year, there was an opportunity to, for all the bar mitzvah boys, all the brides and grooms, all whatever, to, to have like a group meeting with the Rebbe and the Rebbe would deliver a talk and then everyone would go by for a blessing and a dollar. He goes by, the Rebbe looks at him. Everyone, the Rebbe gives a dollar to everybody. It's quick, the line moves quick. But the Rebbe stops and says, did you get my letter? The Rebbe says to him, did you get my letter? And then he realized it was personal. It was the Rebbe knew how. Listen, the Rebbe is a Rebbe. The Rebbe says to him, You got my letter? Like the ultimate story. It's like <laughs> the Rebbe cared that a kid was feeling a little bit, uh, I don't know, not so excited, not so, uh, not so enthused. Anyway, the point though is that what seems to be just something that's replicated thousands of times is a personal, can be a personal experience and really must be a personal experience. Whether it's a letter from a tzaddik or whether it's prayer Tashem or whether it's the mitzvah, right? We're all listening to the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. We're all standing in shul. The shofar sounded, we're listening. It's not the same mitzvah. I have my mitzvah experience. You have your mitzvah experience. And it's supposed to be like that. So the Torah repeats we haven't even done all 12, by the way, because the reading cuts it in the middle. We're going to continue, by the way, and go through the next reading. But we see again and again and again. Why? Because they were different experiences. Different experiences. All right, back inside. Let's actually continue the readings into reading six. And then I want to go back to Rashi's and have a few other insights to share from, from how we started. All right, on the sixth day, we're now almost halfway through. The chieftain was of the sons of God, Eliasaf, the son of Duel. His, his offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels, one silver sprinkling basin weighing 70 shekels, according to the holy shekel, both filled with fine flour mixed with olive oil for a meal offering. One spoon weighing 10 shekels of gold filled with incense, one young bull, one ram and one lamb in its first year for a burnt offering, one young he goat for a sin offering and for the peace offering, Two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs in the first year. This was the offering of Eliasaf, the son of Duel. I feel bad even reading it kind of fast because like it was a unique experience. Literally, the Torah is trying to honor it and I'm knocking it out, but it is what it is. On the seventh day, 
The chieftain was of the sons of Ephraim, one of the sons of Joseph, but they got their own tribal status with the absence of Levi, because the Levites weren't part of this. Um, Elishama, the son of Amihud, his offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels, one silver sprinkling basin weighing 70 shekels, according to the shekel, both full of fine flour mixed with olive oil for a meal offering, one spoon weighing 10 shekels of gold, filled with incense, one young bull, one ram, one lamb in its first year for a burnt offering, one young hego for sin offering, and for the peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs in their first year. This was the offering of Elishama, the son of Amihud. On the eighth day, the chieftain was of the sons of Menasheh, the other son of Joseph, Gamliel, the son of Bedatzer. His offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels, one silver sprinkling basin weighing 70 shekels, according to the Lord Shekel, both full of fine flour mixed with olive oil for a meal offering, one spoon weighing 10 shekels of gold, filled with incense, one young bull, one ram, and one lamb in its, in its first year for a burnt offering, one young he goat for a sin offering and for the peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs in the first year. This was the offering of Gamliel, the son of Pedazer. On the ninth day, the chieftain was of the sons of Benjamin, Abidan, the son of Gedoni. His offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels, one silver sprinkling basin weighing 70 shekels. According to the shekel, both filled with fine flour mixed with olive oil for a meal offering, one spoon weighing 10 shekels of gold filled with incense, one young bull, one ram, one lamb in its first year for a burnt offering, one young he goat for a sin offering, and for the, for the peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs in the first year. This was the offering of Abidan, the son of Gedoni, on the 10th day. The chieftain was of the sons of Dan, Achiezer, the son of Amishana. His offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels, one silver sprinkling basin weighing 70 shekels, according to the shekel, both filled with fine flour mixed with olive oil for a meal offering, one spoon weighing 10 shekels of gold filled with incense, one young bull, one ram, one lamb in its first year for a burnt offering, one young he goat for a sin offering and for the peace offering, two oxen and five rams, five he goats, five lambs in the first year. This was the offering of Achiezer, the son of Amishadai. On the 11th day, we're getting close. The chieftain was the son of Asher, Pagiel, the son of Achron. His offering was one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels, one silver sprinkling basin weighing 70 shekels, according to the Lord Shekel, both full of fine flour mixed with olive oil for a meal offering, one spoon weighing 10 shekels of gold filled with incense, one young bull, one ram, one lamb in his first year for a burnt offering, one young he goat for a sin offering, and for the peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, Five lambs in the first year. This was the offering of Pagiel, the son of Achron. On the 12th day, this is it. 12 days, 12 tribes. On the 12th day. The chieftain was of the sons of Naphtali, Achira, the son of Enan. His offering was, you guessed it, one silver bowl weighing 130 shekels, one silver sprinkling basin weighing 70 shekels, according to the Lord Shekel. Both full of fine flour mixed with olive oil for a meal offering, one spoon weighing 10 shekels of gold filled with incense, one young bull, one ram, one lamb in its first year for a burnt offering, one young he goat for a sin offering, and for the peace offering, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs in the first year. This was the offering of Ahira, the son of Anon. We've covered the 12 days. We've covered the 12 days of gifts to inaugurate the Mishkan. What we've seen today is that upon the occasion of opening day of the tabernacle, upon the occasion, they brought a gift together and separately. The together gift, the wagons and the oxen. The separate gifts were really offerings for the altar each day, one tribe brought an offering. Let's go back to the beginning of reading number five. Let's take a look at some Rashi's. All right, let's take a look at Rashi's. On the day that Mishkan, on the day, it was on the, it, sorry, let me try this again. And it was that on the day that Moses finished, the word in Hebrew for finish is kalos. On the day that Mishkan was erected, the Israelites were like a bride, kala. In Hebrew, bride is kala, and the Hebrew word for finish is kalot which is trying, there's a, Rashi says, there's a linguistic kind of wink that on the day that the Mishkan was finished, it was like we were like a bride entering the chuppah, the nuptial canopy. It's kind of romantic. All right, let's continue. Moses finished. Why Moses? Rashi asks, 
Betzalel, Aliyah, and the wise-hearted men assembled the Mishkan. There's so many people that were on the team. Yet scripture credits Moses with it. Why? Because he utterly devoted himself to it, overseeing that the design of each article conformed with that with what he was shown on Mount Sinai to instruct the craftsmen, and he did not err in any design. In other words, yes, there were others that built it and others that really um, put a lot of effort into creating it, but Moses took the responsibility to make sure it got, got done right. Similarly, we find that with David, King David, since he devoted himself to the building of the temple, as it says, O Lord, remember for David all of his affliction, that he swore to the Lord. Therefore, the temple was called by his name, as it says, see your house, David. The house is called the house of David, even though David didn't finish building it, his son did, Solomon. Yet it's called by his name because of the, the dedication that he had to make sure it got done. Um, On the day that Moses finished erecting, it does not say on the day he erected, but finished erecting the Mishkan. Why? This teaches us that throughout the seven days of investitures, that was the seven days prior to Rosh Kodesh Nisan, the seven days of preparation, Moses erected it, the Mishkan, and dismantled it each day. But on that day, day number seven, or Rosh Kodesh, sorry, that was not the seven day, it was the eighth day. On that day, the first day of the month of Nisan, he erected it, but did not dismantle it. He put it up, and didn't take it down. Therefore, it says Moses finished erecting. The day marked the end of his erecting the Mishkan. It was the new moon of Nisan, as I've been telling you. At least I got it right, right? It was Rosh Chodesh Nisan on that second day. Uh, sorry, on the second day, the red cow was burned. On the third day, they sprinkled the first sprinkling. And on the seventh day, the Levites were shaved as the Torah um, required. The leaders of the tribes brought these offerings. Rashi says, who were these leaders? They, listen to this, very cool. They were the officers appointed over them in Egypt. Remember when the Egyptians had Jewish task, mas task masters to make sure that the Jews fulfilled their quota, but they put Jews in charge of other Jews. Sadly, this would repeat itself in history. We saw even in uh, as recent as uh, the Holocaust, World War II where Jews were appointed to oversee other Jews and put in essentially an impossible position. Um, these officers were beaten on account of them. As it says in Exodus, the officers of the children of Israel were beaten. And these officers who had the impossible job of overseeing the work of their fellow Jews and the Egyptians holding them to task, if they didn't like anything that was done, these became the leaders of the tribes. They were present during the counting. They stood with Moses and Aaron when they counted the Israelites. As it says, with you, Moses and Aaron, there shall be a man for each tribe. And they brought the offering. They brought as a gift six covered wagons and 12 oxen. They presented them in front of the Mishkan. What does that mean? Rashi says, for Moses did not accept them from their hands until he was instructed to do so by the omnipresent by Hashem by God. Moses was a little reluctant to take the wagons and the oxen. Rabbi Nathan says, why did the chieftains see fit to be first to contribute here, whereas concerning the work of the Mishkan, they were not the first to contribute, but the last. When it came to donating the supplies for the Mishkan, let me just explain. They went last. And here, as soon as the Mishkan opened for business, they were the first ones to bring an offering. Oh, we got spoons and bowls and animals. Why did they run to the head of the line? Here we go. Rashi says, however, the chieftain said as follows. When it came to the donation of supplies, let the people contribute what they can, and then we will complement whatever is missing. We'll fill in the rest. But when they saw that the people had supplied everything, as it says, the work was sufficient for them, they said, uh oh, what is left for us to do now? So they brought the shoham stones and the filling stones of the ephod. That's like the breastplate and the choshen and the choshen. Therefore, in order to make amends, they were the they, here they were first to contribute. It's interesting. You know, when you're a leader, should you push yourself to the, to the front of the line or should you wait in the back? So they thought to wait in the back of the line, but it wasn't right. They should have led by example. Their enthusiasm to donate for the Mishkan would have inspired others to donate. So when it came time to open the Mishkan for offerings, they were the ones to say, all right, the altar's open for business. 
We got some animals. We got some flour. We got some incense. They were the first in line because a leader leads from the front, not from the back. When it came for the donation, when it came to the donations of the raw materials to build the Mishkan, they went last. And that was not, that was not good. When it came to the opening of the Mishkan, they went first. Not that they're monopolizing altar time, but they were setting the tone to be excited about bringing Hashem, bringing God Almighty a gift. All right. Um, two wagons, four oxen to Gershon. Rashi says, according to their work, because the burden of the sons of Gershon was lighter, physically lighter and easier than that of the sons of Merari who carried the planks, the pillars and the sockets. Merari did the heavy schlepping. They had four uh, um, wagons and eight they got two-thirds of the wagons and, and oxen. Gershon wasn't so heavy. They got two wagons, four oxen. Rashi, regarding the sons of Kahat, um, the burden of the holy objects, such as the ark and table, was incumbent upon them physically. Therefore, they were to carry on their shoulders and not in wagons. They were not able to delegate the carrying to a wagon or an ox. Then they brought offerings for the dedication of the altar. Rashi says, after they had contributed the wagons and the oxen for carrying the Mishkan, they were inspired to contribute offerings for the altar to dedicate it. And once again, they presented their offerings in front of the altar. For Moses did not accept it from their hands until instructed to do so by the Almighty. All right, one sheep then per day shall present his offering for the dedication of the altar, but Moses did not know how they should bring the offerings, whether in the order of their births, namely in the order in which Jacob's sons were born, Reuben, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, or according to the order in which they traveled until he was instructed by the Holy One, blessed be he, that they should bring the offerings according to the order in which they traveled, each one in his day. Okay. Um, the one who brought the offering on day one was Nachshon, that was on the first day. That day, Rashi says, acquired 10 crowns. 10 things happened on that day. It was the first day of creation, according to some opinions, the first day of the offerings of the chieftains, etc. as stated in Seder Olam, a book that discusses history. The tribe of Judah, scripture traces his kinship to his tribe. But not that he solicited the offering from his tribe and then offered it up. In other words, he was of the tribe of Judah, but it's not that he brought it on behalf of his tribe. He, he brought it on behalf of himself. But he's the representative of, of Judah. Or perhaps, Rashi says, maybe it says of the tribe of Judah, teaches that he indeed solicited the offering from his tribe and then brought it. So which one was it? Was he from the tribe of Judah but brought it on his own? Or did he bring it on behalf of his tribe? Scripture therefore states, this was the offering of Nachshon, the son of Nadab, teaches that he brought from his own resources. It was his own offering. Silver bowl and silver sprinkling basin carried the flour for a voluntary meal offering. One spoon, ten, ten shekels of gold, as Uncleus Targum Uncleus renders it, it contained the weight of ten shekels of silver according to the holy shekel. Filled with incense, we never find incense brought by an individual or on the outer copper altar, except in this case, this was a temporary order to bring the incense on the outer altar by an individual. Usually it's brought on behalf of the community inside the uh, the Mish inside the uh, OMO, inside the tent of meeting on the golden altar. One young bull, the choice of the herd, says Rashi. One young he goat for sin offering to atone for uncleanness caused by a grave in the depths, i.e. an unknown grave which may lie in the earth over which people unknowingly pass, rendering them unclean, which is the case which is a case of uncertain contamination. I told you before, a sin offering here is inadvertent. You did, it was a mistake. What mistake are we specifically talking about here? Walking along the field and not knowing that somebody is buried under there because it's an unmarked grave, becoming ritually impure and then going where one should not. It's unintentional. You don't, may, may not even ever find out about it, 
but there's some level of uh, of sin that needs to be fixed. Um, Rashi tells us about the order of the tribes. Why is the word Hikrib brought as offering used in connection with the tribe of Issachar, but is not used in connection with any of the other tribes? Because the tribe of Reuben came and complained. Listen to this. Again, I told you Reuben went forth, even though they were the first, uh, firstborn. It, is it not enough that my brother Judah has preceded me? Let me at least offer it up after him. Reuben said, okay, you want to give it to Judah? The, he's the royal tribe. Eventually the kings are going to, okay, fine. Let Judah go first. But at least I should go second. Moses said to him, I was told by the Almighty that they should offer up, um, offer up in the order in which they travel according to their divisions. I'm skipping a little bit. What is the meaning of hikriv hikriv twice? He brought, he brought. Why does it repeat it? For because of two reasons, Issachar merited to be the second of the tribes to offer their sacrifices. Why did Issachar go second and not Reuben? One, because they were well-versed in Torah. They were Torah scholars. As it says in the sons of Issachar, are those who had understood, who, those who had understanding of the time. So they were the ones who had the Torah knowledge. So that moves you up to the front of the line. Another reason, because they advised the chieftains to contribute these offerings. It was their idea to do this whole thing. It was the, the head of the tribe of Issachar said, hey guys, I have a great idea. Let's bring these offerings. So of course, they bumped them to the front of the line or at least to the second. In the writings of Rav Moshe Darshan, I found the following. Rav Pinchas, the son of Yar, says that Nathanael, the son of Tzor, gave them the idea. That is the one. He is the one who gave them the idea, Nathanael and Tzor, of the tribe of Issachar. I want to skip this. There's a lot of symbolism here that I, I feel like we don't have time to really get into the symbolism. So hopefully maybe on Friday, we'll get back to this. Rashi gets into Gematria. Very cool. You don't always find Gematria in Rashi. Rashi is usually the simple uh, thing. He doesn't usually get into numerology. But if you look over here, Rashi is going to talk about the um, numerology of one silver bowl in Hebrew, 930 the years of Adam's life. You can talk about the uh, sprinkling basin, 520, Noah, etc. Basically, just to give you a, a, a general understanding without getting to the specifics, every item that the heads of the tribes donated each of the 12 days, not just the flower and the animals, like the incense, but I mean like the, the hardware, like the, the bowls with their precise weight, silver, gold, whatever, it was a, a precise allusion to something in history. Adam, Noah, Abraham, some sort of, you know, message of history, how we got to where we are. Um, it's very cool. Very, every, everything's steeped with symbolism. I don't, I, I want to give do justice to it. So let's pick that up on Friday. Um, but I want to end off with a, a bit of a, just a, another quick point on the order of the tribes. Um, who brought first? I'm not going to go through all of them, but the first four days or so, three days, three or four days. It was Ruvain. Sorry, it wasn't Ruvain. It was Judah, Yehuda, who went first. Why? He was, he had become, or that tribe had become the leader of the tribes in many ways. The Levites were the spiritual leaders, obviously, Kohanim, Levim. But Judah, amongst the Israelites, Judah was the leader. If you recall, it was Judah himself, the original Judah, the son of Jacob, who was the one who gave the advice to sell Joseph as a slave. And the brothers listened to him. He was the one who gave the advice, sorry, stood up to Joseph when he didn't know he was Joseph to rescue his brother Benjamin. Judah was the one who took action. Judah was the one who would father, ultimately, King David, King Solomon, and Mashiach. David, uh, um, Judah is the is the is the tribe of kings of strength so he goes first he's the leader he goes first then as we read in rashi yisachar or isachar why number one they it was his idea <laughs> he's like hey let's do this all right so you you get the, the the idea giver you 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 give him credit you know maybe not top billing but at least second billing but number two because he studied torah 
And herein, once again, we find this idea that Torah is number one available to anybody and everybody. And Torah generates a tremendous merit. Why Zavulun? Why Zebulun? Why did they go third? So here's the answer, even though we didn't see it in Rashi. The answer is because Issachar and Zavulun, Zebulun, had a very tight connection. Those two brothers, Issachar, they were the scholars. Zebulun, Zavulun, they were the merchants. They had the boats, the ships. They were the seafaring merchants. The Talmud tells us that there was an arrangement specifically between those two tribes. Those guys went to work and those guys studied. They took the money from the, the, some of the profits of work and they supported Torah scholarship. They supported the institutions of Torah. That was the partnership. Hence, the supporters, Tom Chei Torah, the supporters of Torah, they get bumped to the top of the line. So it was Judah, Issachar, and then Zebulun, Zebulun. They That was the top three of the batting order. You know, top three batting order, that means you're guaranteed to, to hit first inning, right? Top three of the batting order. You have Judah, the king, you have the scholars, and right there together, you have those that support Torah. And after that, you get into the birth order. Ruvain, Shimon, after that, the order unfolds. But the three special tribes, very unique relationship. And it reminds us of something that the Rebbe would always say. And that is, we all have an obligation to study Torah. We all have an obligation to support Torah. We all have an obligation to ensure that the legacy and continuity of Torah continue. And so we're reminded here, as we read about something com seemingly completely disconnected, we're reminded about the central role that Torah plays in our people and in our communities and in our hearts, souls, and lives. All right, so with that, we'll close it out for today. Um, so again, just to, just to conclude what we do today, we talked about the donations or the gifts of the tribal leaders. Oh, one, one more thing. I have to mention one more thing. They gave six wagons, 12 oxen, and then each day they gave a gift. But one, one more point. The Talmud discusses in great detail how the six wagons were used by the two families, the Levites, to precisely get all the curtains and the beams. And it was just, just, just enough. Hey, hey, guys. Hey, Sam. That's a surprise. Look at that. It's a party. <laughs> um, yeah, no, Sam is here. It's the party. By the way, Sam, you yes. did a great job oh. Saturday night. Great <laughs> feedback. Great feedback from your talk. Thank and that was just for me. No, yeah. really, you did a great, no, you did a great job. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So the Talmud discusses in great detail about how the six wagons were just, just, just enough to get all the stuff of the Mishkan loaded on. The Rebbe asks a question. If you're donating wagons already, give a few extra wagons. Give a few extra wagons. Give some breathing room. The Talmud says that it was balancing. The beams were a little bit off this way, off that way, but it was okay. It didn't fall off, and the Levites would stand just in case it would teeter a little bit. Are you kidding me? Go big. Get another 12 wagons or another six wagons. Everyone had to donate a half a wagon. Come on. Rebbe says, no, that's the point. If you can maximize six wagons, then you have no excuse to waste the seventh. Every resource that God has given you, every resource that exists should be utilized to the utmost. Why should you only fill the wagon halfway? And the Rebbe says, this is true in our lives. Again, if, you could, if six wagons can hold the Mishkan, 12 wagons, it means you're not, you're not maximizing. You're not maximizing the capacity. The Rebbe says the message for us in life is each of us has tremendous gifts, our wagons, as it were. Tremendous gifts. Everyone has, are you, are you, there, you, you and I have unique gifts. But the message here is don't squander. Don't go 50%. Don't go 75%. Don't even go 90%. 100%. All in. You know what they say. You know, it's basketball season now. Something, 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 playoffs, right? Or finals. Um, you leave it all on the court. 
right? You leave it all on the court. That's it. There's no, you don't leave any energy behind. You're not saving anything, any reserves. This is it. This is it. Life, in life, we're given gifts. We're given opportunities. Maximize, maximize, maximize. Don't hold back. Al-Toymar, Lichashay, F, Lichashay, don't say when I have extra time, then I'm going to learn. Maybe you'll never have that time. Maximize it right now. It's Pirkei Abbas. It's not my Pirkei Abbas, ethics of our fathers. Don't push things off for later. Don't go 50%. Go all in 100%. Hundo P, as Nassim says, go all in and leave nothing on the court. That's the message for today. We all have gifts. We all have potential. We all have tremendous opportunities. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Thanks for joining me today for DPP. It's great to see you, Sam, <laughs> Olia, Joy, and Ray, and Joy. It's great to see you all. Wonderful. Oh, one, one quick announcement. Tonight, 730. Don't miss it. We have a tremendous, tremendous Torah studies class. It's all about the curious case of Benjamin. No. The curious case <laughs> of Samuel, the prophet. Very curious origin story. If you want to know what I'm talking about, well, there's only one way to find out. Tonight, 7.30 in person or on Zoom. Torah studies, please join. All right, we'll see you all. Have a wonderful day. Lots of blessings. Take Thank care, you. everybody. Great Thank to see you. you.